Good morning. Unless I'm mistaken, oh, we're coming to the end of August, aren't we? So that means that uh, today is the last day that the children have the amazing privilege of staying in and listening to the speaker. But following on from Mark, uh, you have the flexibility of doing some colouring or walking about or perhaps not paying full attention. But uh, hopefully there's a little bit for the children this morning. But if you do do some colouring, uh, I forgive you, which is what today's chapter is all about. So we have been doing a series on... Um, the ups and downs of life. It's kind of like the August series, and then we'll get back to normal. And we're now on page 979 of the Church Bibles. If you uh, did want to get one, there's some at the back. Um, maybe if you need one, put your hand up. They can be given to you. But um, we have a sort of a, quite a few verses to get through, um, and they are fascinating verses. They're wonderful. So I will begin straight away by reading uh, some of them, the first section, and the, the little heading that's been inserted is, if your brother sins against you. It's verse 15 of chapter 18 of Matthew 9, 7, 9 in the church Bibles. <clears throat> so let me read uh, the first five verses. If your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven again i say to you if two or three agree uh, sorry if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask it will be done for them by my father in heaven for where two or three are gathered in my name there am i amongst them now, how many times have you heard those last two verses? Where, oh, where two or three are gathered, my, my name. You've heard them. Or whatever you ask in my name, it will be granted. And uh, in preparing for this, I've realized that, uh, well, I've used those verses many times in prayer or in gathering. But with the Bible, context is very important. And uh, often the context of those verses, what we've just read before, about forgiveness and church discipline, they are kind, that context isn't, it's, it's ignored. And so to summarize the big picture of those verses, firstly, we need to take every length, we need to go to every length in the church to make sure that there's no sin that isn't dealt with, that there are no problems that aren't sorted out. Secondly, if that doesn't happen, it's a matter for the whole church. It, it's so important that it becomes something for the whole church if it can't be sorted out privately. And thirdly, if it can't be sorted out, it's so important that actually it needs to be removed. The person needs to be removed because the church is a holy place. And Jesus appears to be connecting making a connection between what is bound, what is tied up on heaven and earth, between heaven and earth, and what has just been spoken about. There appears to be some kind of connection. He appears to be connecting our agreement and our unity with the Father doing what we ask. And he appears to be connecting his presence, where two or three gather, with that church unity, with the oneness of the church. I don't think that Jesus is saying that where two or three gather, 
and they've got some problems and they've got some hurts and they've got some unforgiveness and they've got some issues and so on. I am in the midst of you. I don't think Jesus is trying to say that. I don't think he's trying to say in similar circumstances that where two or three gather and they've got issues and problems and they're not really united, I'll do whatever you ask. I don't think he's saying that. Jesus is telling us about the utmost importance of being at one with each other, sorting out things when they go wrong, as they inevitably will do from time to time. And it's in that context, Peter, good old Peter, decides to chip in. And so we follow on with verse 21 where Jesus tells the story about the unforgiving servant. Verse 21, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Peter probably thought he had the answer cracked. I think he came up with the answer no, number seven, because I don't know, you know, I, I'm, I'm surmising. Maybe he'd, he'd blown it six times. He thought, maybe I've got one more, more chance. Uh, or maybe he thought, you know, this is an incredible amount of patience. So I'm going to go for seven and the Lord's going to say, you know, you know, well done, Peter. You're spot on with that. But Jesus doesn't say that. He says, I do not say seven times, but 77 times. And many of the translations actually say 70 times seven. Uh, it's difficult to translate which is which. But um, and then he tells the story. Jesus moves into telling this story. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts. I mean, I love that bit to start with because it, there's so many parallels. You know, it's the king who wants to settle the accounts with his servants. <clears throat> so when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and payments to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So this fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servant saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now, whether the number of times that Jesus says we need to forgive, whether it's seven times seven, 49, or 70 times 7, 490, I'm quite sure that Jesus is not saying that on the 50th occasion, that's it. You don't forgive. On the 491st occasion, that's run out. <laughs> He's using an expression to say that using those numbers, that this is a perfect and complete amount of forgiveness that I'm talking about, and it doesn't end. It doesn't stop. <clears throat> And he also uses this story to illustrate the extent of the forgiveness that we are to have for one another. His servant, who owes him a debt, owes 10,000 talents to his king. He begs forgiveness. He's released from that debt. And that servant refuses to forgive or to let off his fellow servant with a much smaller amount. The 10,000 talents, I'm not sure why that's doing that, is it? Okay. Catching my, ah, it's my beard. I can't shave it off because Enid says I'm not a man if I shave it off. So 
and she won't allow me and I've had it for 40 odd years and I'm just not allowed ever to shave it off. If, if I come to church without my beard, you know there's a problem. The 10,000 talents that the king lets off his servant is equivalent to, wait for it, about 200,000 lifetimes salary. 200,000 lifetimes of salary. Give or take a few hundred years. <laughs> And the servant says, be patient. I'll pay everything. <laughs> Which is ridiculous. He's a servant. He's not, he's not Jeff Bezos. He's not Bill Gates. We're talking about seven billion pounds, give or take. Seven billion pounds. Seven thousand million pounds of debt. It's way beyond the servant's ability. We can't even try and imagine it. And because he pleads for the king to let him off, he does so. All of it. But his fellow servant owes him a hundred denarii. A hundred days wages. Let's say 15,000 pounds. And that servant refuses. To let him off. Now I'm, I'm going to pause there for a minute. We'll come back to all of this. But um, I'm going to just involve uh, at least one of the young people now. Because about 20 years ago from this very spot, I was preaching, I was talking. And before I started, uh, before I prepared, I'd come across this example of a, a professor, a physics professor, who had um, decided that he was going to teach something in his big auditorium about Newton's second law of motion. Paul, you know what that is, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, very good, yeah. Now I'm going to ask Samuel if he would just join me. And bring a chair, you could bring one of the front chairs. And if you could just put the chair about here and maybe just so you don't fall off it, Samuel, we can do it that way and stand up. And you, if you need to, you can, are you okay? But you, you're all right there? Okay. Are you going to be okay there for the rest of the morning? Is that all right? Because I thought, this professor had demonstrated in his big auditorium a pendulum. And pendulum has to do with, well, it was kind of formulated by Galileo, but Newton did the uh, formula. And it basically says a pendulum will come back exactly to the same place unless some force is applied to it. Um, of course, in the real world, there's friction and there's air resistance. So it will never come back further than where you let it off. So what I did was the night before is I got a tennis ball on a piece of fishing wire and I put it over that beam and then I pulled up a rope and I got one of these big suitcases, you know, the kind of the big sort of leather trunks that you, you know, uh, would be on a porter's trolley in the 1920s on the Orient Express, one of these big leather trunks and it seemed pretty strong. And I filled it full of bricks. And I asked the young volunteer uh, there was some risk involved in those days, you know, but health and safety was not a big deal and children were expendable then, so it wasn't. <laughs> so so I, I, I got this thing and I made sure, I practiced the night before to make sure that the swing of that pendulum, where the suitcase, the swing was going to rise and it wasn't quite, so I moved these two sets of chairs here, the front two. So then over Lillian's head, it was a reasonably safe sort of thing, you know, going back into the audience up that way and coming back. And I was going to demonstrate that as it came back, it would not hit young Samuel or Simon. It was Simon Williamson's nose. And it was it was a demonstration of faith. Did, did, did he trust that what I was saying was true? So I brought this suitcase back like this. 
and I held it right against his nose and I let go. As soon as I let go, I realized something was wrong. Someone had come in earlier than me in the morning, seen the big gap and moved all the chairs back forward. And the front row had about one second to realize. And then they fell upon each other's laps. They dived sideways. The second row had slightly less time because the things were obscured. So they went backwards like that as it kind of scythed through. And it was more impressive than the parting of the Red Sea. Barely had they time to get back. And of course, to see it coming back again. So the whole thing happened again as it swung back. But it came all the way back like this and it stopped there and to be fair young simon trusted what was being said and he did not flinch okay you you can you can you've you've served a wonderful purpose let's get in over here <laughs> That's it. That's all you have to do. Oh, you can leave that there. That's, oh, is that your chair? No, don't worry about it. No, that's fine. Oh. So why have I told you this story? Um, we couldn't do it today. They wouldn't allow us, would they? The elders wouldn't allow us to do that sort of thing. I love that sort of thing. <clears throat> there you go. Why have I told you this story? Well, there's a word. There's a word that um, we don't use that often. Uh, and it's a word which describes God, and it's a word which is called, well, the word is immutable, immutable. <clears throat> it means that God is unchanging. He doesn't get better. He doesn't get worse. He's already perfect. His wisdom is perfect. There is nothing that will change about the nature and the character of God. He is immutable. His purposes, his promises, the laws, if you like, if I can say that, associated with his character, God cannot lie, that sort of thing. They are not going to change. <clears throat> James 1.17 puts it, he says it like this, it's beautiful. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God is immutable. He's perfect, unchanging. And like Newton's second law, God's character is defined and what will happen will happen. <clears throat> but there's an awful lot of ifs. The pendulum came right the way back, just as he said, but there's an awful lot of ifs. That happened in between the ups and downs of life. If the chairs get moved, something unexpected is going to happen. <laughs> Fortunately, no one got hurt. Jesus said that trials, temptations, difficulties are inevitable. They are bound to come. In fact, when Rob was here last week, he covered that in verse 7. Jesus mentioned that. Trials, temptations, they are bound to come. They are inevitable. And so we come to the really challenging bit, I think, really challenging bit of our section today. <clears throat> because after telling the story of the unforgiving servant, he closes that section. He, he closes it. I, I just sort of do the prelude. He says, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now, wow, that's that's that, that's pretty that's that's quite hard, isn't it? 
my heavenly father will do the same to you if you do not forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. Just a quick summary. He said the servant should have had mercy in the same way that the king showed mercy. The king was angry with that servant because he didn't release his fellow servant from the debt, but instead choked him, put him into prison. God will do exactly the same to them, Jesus said, unless they forgive from the heart. So who is Jesus saying this to? He's saying it to Peter and the disciples. He's saying it to people who love Jesus, want to follow him, his disciples. He's not saying it to the um, Pharisees and the Sadducees. And to reinforce the point, he says, my father will do this to every one of you. God sends his immutable sense, mercy, forgiveness, the nature of his character. It doesn't mean that he has a kind of top tier of disciples where he says, well, uh, you're okay. The next, step, the next level, they will be on the naughty step for a week. And the ones that I'm not so keen with, they're going to be in prison until they sort it out. No, every one of you. Now, we should definitely notice that this is the consequence if we do not pay our debt. It's absolutely not about salvation. We can never pay the debt of salvation. That's the 200,000 lifetimes of debt that the king paid, let off. So this is about us paying a debt that we can pay. It's not about salvation from the king. This is not a debt of sin that we owe to God, and he alone can pay that. Salvation belongs to God. Now, the debt that we're asked to pay in full is the forgiveness of our brother, our sister, who may owe us something because of their sin. This is between a servant and a fellow servant, a brother and a sister in the church, in the body of Christ. We were and remain completely unable to, to pay the extent of that debt that Jesus illustrates 200,000 lifetimes. We cannot do that. <laughs> but we can release others from their debt to us. And it's not the only place that we come across such uncompromising language from Jesus. Back in Matthew chapter 6, in the Beatitudes, seems a long time ago we did that, the Beatitudes, we encountered the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive others have forgiven others sorry as we also have forgiven something about this i've written down wrong and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil i find it interesting in matthew that jesus then goes on to qualify and comment on that prayer it's the only qualification and comment that he makes. Because the next verse, verse 14 of chapter 6 says, For if, there's that if again, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It's the only part of the prayer that he mentions. <clears throat> Who's he talking to again? 
he's talking to his disciples who came up to the quiet place to listen to him at the Sermon on the Mount, to his disciples. Why is such a fundamental importance given to the forgiveness of our brothers and our sisters from our hearts? As our verse concludes with today, why does the consequence of our unforgiveness appear to butt up against the absolute, unchangeable, immutable law of God's character such that he will not forgive us our trespasses if we do not forgive others. We may be saved, and we are, God willing, destined for heaven, and nothing will change that gift from him. Nothing. It's the gift of salvation. But we will be bound up on earth by heaven, locked up in our lives down below, unless we release others' debts. Why is that? Well, I think it has to do with grace. Grace is the foundational building block of the good news of the gospel. For me, it's, it's a foundation of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave, he gave. By grace, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16, probably the best known verse in the Bible. The king paid our debt at the cost of his son. Fully. Grace given to us. By grace we are saved, Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. Grace is the pillar which supports the rest of the gospel. If a disciple doesn't understand or accept grace, and many don't, and I probably don't fully appreciate it, I don't think any of us fully appreciate grace, then it follows that we will think that salvation has something to do with us. It's a, it's a, for me, it's a logical secretary. It, it, we will think that it's to do with us. It's, it's our work, it's our status, it's our character, it's our achievements. And if it's something to do with us, then might we not have every right to hold a grudge or make judgment about someone else? Because after all, we're in a, a different position to judge that their sin is worse than our sin. We have every right in those circumstances to hold them accountable, to harbor our grudges, to choke them, <laughs> throw them into prison, even if it's just in the imaginations of our thoughts. Don't we have every right to withhold our forgiveness? if salvation is something to do with us. After all, the speck in my eye is much smaller than the log in theirs. And as you will realize, Jesus had that the other way around. But grace tells us that we've all sinned. We all fall short of God's goodness. There's no one deserving. All are condemned. So if I don't understand or at least accept grace, then it follows that I'm full of self-pride. If we don't accept that gr uh, grace, <clears throat> then my life is about, my life is about me, I, mine, instead of he, him, and his. If we don't accept grace, then it means that what we do not know or understand is the nature of God's love. And so, of course, that leads to being bound up, remaining in bondage in some way, being tied up. It's an immutable fact, an unchangeable fact, that that's what's going to happen between heaven and earth if we do not forgive. If we're indeed Christians, and I'm sure we are, we have no option 
but to forgive and to forgive from our hearts. And I don't know about you, but I find that really hard. <laughs> I find that really hard. But it's impossible if you don't know and accept grace. It's impossible, in my view. If you don't know and accept grace, the king has forgiven me. It's impossible to forgive from your heart. And what does it mean to forgive from the heart? So for any young ones here, we all know what it, what it means when we say, sorry. <coughs> Samuel, have you ever said sorry? Is sorry, sorry, is sorry from the heart? Is it something from the heart? When mum and dad insist, insist that you say sorry, or you won't get the ice cream. Sorry. <laughs> but on the inside, that's not what you're really thinking. She poked me in the arm. I have every right to hit around the head with the cricket bat. He spilled paint on my drawing. Obviously, I'm going to tear his up. If I must, I will say, sorry. But my heart is not sorry. I've not got there yet. I'm not in a forgiving mood. And for the benefit of the children that are here, just so you know, adults aren't any different. <laughs> They've just learned to be mad and unforgiving in different ways. Resentment churns around and uh, it just... Uh, they backbite and they gossip and they say bad things about someone and all the rest of it. <clears throat> and they seek revenge in perhaps ways that aren't seen. What they do is they drink a cup of poison expecting the other one to be harmed. How foolish is that? <laughs> That's unforgiveness. Drinking a cup of poison, thinking, Graham, you'll be really hurt. <laughs> ah. I would suggest that you can only begin to forgive from the heart when grace has so impacted you. You realize you too are a sinner, forgiven by our gracious King, an impossible debt to repay ourselves. Sinners saved by grace and by grace alone. And the Holy Spirit teaches us and shapes us in this grace. But if we do get locked up in unforgiveness, we are only released from its bondage if we pay the debt of forgiving. The debt of forgiving those who sinned against us just as our Father has forgiven us. What is forgiveness? Well, it doesn't mean ignoring the hurt. It doesn't mean that we don't get angry. It doesn't mean that somehow we just on a different planet, we let it all float over us. Doesn't matter. Jesus didn't go into that temple courtyard and seeing the money changes doing their business he didn't say oh, okay guys it's cool each to their own doesn't really matter <clears throat> he was really really upset really angry he took time it must have taken time to make a, a whip of cords and then to go around turning the banking tables over driving out all the animals he caused an absolute riot, an absolute stampede. I mean, it must have been complete pandemonium. If that had happened somewhere today, in today's context, lots of people would have been shouting out, call yourself a Christian. <laughs> Does that happen to you? It happens to me occasionally. Call yourself a Christian happened last week. Call yourself a Christian. 
Perhaps people have said that to you when they're angry or challenged, when you're, you are angry or you've challenged someone in some way. Call yourself a Christian because people expect Christians to be all nice and meek and mild and, oh, it's okay, everyone's lovely, aren't they? Forgiveness does not pass over sin. It doesn't make out that it doesn't matter. That will all be okay in the end. Best not cause anyone any offence. That's not forgiveness. The difficult thing for me, probably for you, is learning to react to other people's sin for Jesus' sake and not for mine. Learning to react for his sake his righteousness, not for my reputation, not for my wounded pride. Jesus was zealous for his father's house. That's why he made the whip of cords. There's no suggestion that, oh, I'm really, I'm really put out here. He was zealous for his father's house. And that's what we need to be zealous for, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not our own pride, our reputation, our hurt, our desire for revenge. Ephesians 4.26, be angry, be angry, but do not sin. It's really hard. It's really hard being angry and not sinning because so much of my anger is about me. Be angry for the Lord and do not sin in that. And settle things quickly. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. It's very difficult, very difficult thing to be angry and not sin. Very difficult not to let things churn around and upset you on the inside. But it only happens that Churning around happens when my focus is on me as opposed to my focus being on Jesus. So if your brother or sister sins against you, go sort it out. Go sort it out and do it quickly. Do it quickly. For Jesus' sake. For Jesus' sake. And if you come to the communion table, as we will now, I meant to get one loaf because the communion table is about one loaf. The unity of the body of Christ. One cup, one loaf. One body. With that harmony. With the unity. With an openness. With no hidden problems, grudges, unforgiveness. One loaf, one body. If you come to the communion table, it would be no surprise following this morning. If there's anything, make sure you've got it sorted out before you come. And of course, this is for those who've understood that they have been sorted out the bigger debt, the 200,000 lifetimes first. The forgiveness from the Father. So, Having had the forgiveness of the Father, then we make sure that we remain at one with each other. So, Claire, can I ask you to come back? Claire is going to just uh, sing, I think, or lead us in a song. And I would ask you now, just to, just, you know, if there's something. And it may not be here, but it, it may be that, okay, I, I will talk to the person next to me or I'll talk to Marigold because she's seen it all before. But I've got this problem. I, uh, ah, I'm in prison about that. I'm locked up. I need to release it. And then come to communion. It's so important. And I think that today's verses if we read them again and see them in context, yeah, where two or three are gathered, 
I'm in the midst of you, but I'm in the midst of you when you are one body, open, clean, forgiving each other, then I'm in the midst of you. Then you can ask, and I will do it. So often we just take those two verses and say, oh, two or three are gathered. No. Think about the context. Think about how it applies to the church. Think about how we are one body forgiven so much by the king. We should, we must, we have to be at one with each other. So, Father, I thank you for this lesson. I thank you that Jesus has spoken these very demanding words to us. And I pray, Lord, that the unity of the Spirit amongst us, indeed amongst your body locally and beyond, that that unity only increases and that there is an openness, a oneness amongst us. We don't have to agree with everything, but, Lord, we have to forgive and remember grace. And so I pray for that in this place, in your name, where more than two or three are gathered this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.